Enduro and enduro riding has got to be one of the most popular types of riding out there. Cruising up some climbs, bombing some downhills, and then doing it over and over again is nothing but smiles for miles. So having your bike set up correctly is crucial. Now over my years of racing and years of chatting to other pros about their bikes, I've got some great tips and tricks. So here is the ultimate enduro setup guide. Let's kick things off at the front end, the handlebars. Now, 800 mil is kind of a go-to-ish sort of number for a lot of downhill riders, downhill racers, bombing it around flat out, faster, rougher, wider gives you a little bit more control. However, enduro is a bit different because whilst we're doing all of that, we've also got to go back up. We've got a lot of tight twistiness, we've got a lot of tech. We've also got a lot of variety in where and what we ride as well. So that kind of width is maybe a little bit on the wide side, I would say. Wider bars, they're also gonna change your sort of, your stance, your body position on the bike. They're gonna open you up, bring out those shoulders, those elbows much wider. Now, this is kind of good when it's flat out, but like I said, we don't wanna be like this when it's real tech. We wanna come in a little, not like a little T-Rex obviously, but you know, if you can bring it in, it's gonna give you that more wiggle room to play with. So here, 740s to 760 mil is kind of the go-to range. I run 760s pretty much across all of my bike except for my dirt jump bike, and I run 740s on my XC bike. And I know a lot of pros basically do the same as well. If you're running 800s at the moment, Try cutting them down, but do it incrementally. So maybe just five mils or 10 mil at the most each end until you get to maybe the width you want. Remember, you can take off metal or carbon. You can't really add it back on. On to controls. Now, we used to set our controls up so they were just comfy all the time. The kind of old adage was that they, the lever position would run in line with your arms. When you were sitting on the bike and riding along, the levers would be at the same angle if you were to carry on a straight line from, from your upper body. Now this doesn't really work anymore. Enduro is all about flat out downhill, right? I know you've got to get back up, but the time section, the important parts, are bombing downhill. And for that, we need our positions slightly changed. Think about it. If you've got a, quite a steep lever when you're going downhill, to then reach for, for, further forwards and get it, it becomes harder. You're gonna to wanna to flatten your levers. You'll notice it's kind of the reverse. When it comes to XE, those guys, and myself included again, are running a steeper lever. You'll spend a lot more time in the saddle, a lot more time sitting up, a lot more upright. So you can get away with that old sort of all in line kind of feel. But bombing downhill, steeper your bike goes, I would say the flatter you want to put your levers. Also with your controls, have a little experiment where your brake levers are going to sit both inbound and the actual lever reach themselves. That's different for everybody. I run mine quite far out. I know Neil and Blake, they run theirs quite close to the bar. Could be dependent upon hand size as well. And also you want to be ergonomic. You want to be able to reach the levers and the, the thumb shifters, the paddles, if you like, whenever you're riding. So you know, my uh, dropper here on the left-hand side, it sits nicely at the end of my thumb. I don't want it running too far in because it becomes harder to press. So you never really want to have to move your hand as such to be able to push any or pull any of the controls. Last but by no means least, in enduro, hand guards. Not controls as such, but a lot of riders are running hand guards. This is a bit of a, a love-hate. There's a Marmite thing going on with hand guards. They do serve a purpose. You know, they will protect your hands from bashing them into trees, brushing on any kind of well, cactus if you're out here in Arizona. Uh, some people think they look a bit kooky, maybe not necessary all the time. It's a personal preference thing. Okay, in the world of Enduro, a dropper post is crucial for two reasons. One, you gotta go up the hill, so you need your seat at the correct height. It can't be down low, really uncomfortable to ride, that ain't gonna work. And at the same time, when it comes to descending, pow, you want it as far away out the way as possible. So on this bike here, I've opted for a 200 mil dropper. That's as long as I can get in. I've got it basically slammed all bar, maybe five mil. The important part is this height here, so when it's up fully extended, is the correct height for my height, my extensions of my legs, so it's comfortable when I'm pedaling, essentially. And I've gone for the longest drop I can so that it slams this all the way out the way. It's as far out the way as it can possibly be for when I'm shredding back downhill. Now, two reasons for that. One, it's out of the way. It means I can move my body weight around as much as possible. And also, it just means I've actually got a lot to play with as well. So, if I only want it back up a touch just for a quick sprint or something like that, or to take the weight off of my knees or my legs when I'm getting tired, I can without having it to go all of the way. Obviously though, when it comes to dropper posts, you do want to go for as much as you can, I think, 
but you've got to check the insertion length on your frame. Not all frames are going to take a 200 mil. You can see the seat tube on this Orbea here is really long, so you can get away with it. Double check with the manufacturer first. Let's talk frame size. I'm six foot. This is a size large. It's 485 reach, and it fits me bob on. But people like Jesse Melamed, Richie Rood, Jack Moyer even, they're of similar heights and they're all sizing down. Why is that then? And should you? So the reasoning behind it is basically a smaller bike is slightly more agile, a bit more maneuverability. You can throw it around tight, twisty tracks. It comes into, own its, into its own a little bit more. But the, all of those guys have been known to say that actually when they're back home riding trails, they're comfortable on trails they ride all the time. They'll ride the correct size bike for them, if you like, a size large instead of a medium, etc. Now, bike industry, things are getting longer, lower, slacker as well, like we said before, droppers are getting longer. So you can get away with riding a size down. But that's not to say they don't, and that's not to say that you should either. For most of us then, well, we're only gonna have the one bike. We don't have the luxury of being able to choose between sizes. So unless you want that small, fun, flickable bike that you can ride on tight, techy terrain and you don't ride too much of the flat out stuff, maybe go down a size. However, I'd probably stick to the size that's recommended for you. Now we're on to suspension. Suspension is a humongous topic in itself, but an enduro bike's typically 160, 170, maybe up to 180 on the front mill travel bikes. They're big burly things. Few people like to break the mold. Jesse Melamed, Reese Werner, they ride sort of slightly lesser travel trail bikes, but still with a lot of travel up front but it's how these bikes are set up, how this suspension works that is done different in Enduro. With suspension set up, if we think of downhill, we think rock solid suspension, high speeds, big impacts, and sag can be around 15 to 20% for those kind of guys. The sag on an Enduro bike is gonna be a little bit more. Riders are actually gonna set up their bikes a touch softer because they're doing a lot of stuff blind. They don't know what they're gonna hit a lot of the time. So sag could be 25 to 30% on a lot of pros bikes, mine included. I run mine at about the 25% and it ramps up quite firmly. But its beginning of the stroke is softer, therefore it will absorb all the small bumps and absorbs all the small bumps. But when there's a big hit, it will ramp up and take that as well. When it comes to the actual setup of the suspension, now, a lot of the time it's gonna be an air fork up front and coil is kind of creeping in at the back. A lot of air shock still, mainly because of the weight actually. An air shock is just lighter. And although these are big burly bikes, they still wanna keep the weight down, so you'll find an air shock. I like the feel of a coil, so that's why I've got one on the back of mine. Riders are also going to run their suspension so it ramps up. So it's going to be soft at the beginning of the stroke to absorb all that small bump and have that nice little bit of compliance. But should there be any unexpected big hits and it's going to ramp up nicely and absorb that as well. Slightly softer suspension is also going to be a little bit comfier as well. Remember, enduro bikes, enduro racing is big days out on the bike. So if you've got rock hard suspension, well, you're going to need some rock hard arms to handle that all day. Slightly softer suspension is going to be a lot more forgiving on the body. You're not going to get fatigued as quickly. You're going to be able to ride longer and harder, hopefully. So there's another definite perk to it there. Moving down to sort of the belly of the beast, your drivetrain here. So we're going to talk cranks and pedals right now. Enjoy riders, myself again included. I'm putting, them, I'm putting it out there, I'm myself in that bracket are running shorter cranks. These are 165s on this bike. And the reason for that is less pedal strikes, cadence can be kept nice and high, and you're gonna run quite a small chain ring on there as well. 32 to 34 is kind of the norm. And what a lot of riders will do is, we've obviously got a little chain guide at the top here. This is gonna stop the chain from bouncing off. I don't, but a lot do. And you know, it is, can be uh, recommended if it does get really rough and rocky, is a bash guard. Something that's gonna bolt to the ISCG tabs here underneath and protect that chain ring from any rock strikes as well. Onto pedals, I'm running flats today, but normally we know that I'm a, I'm a clip kind of guy. Now clips, when it gets really rough for me, help keep my feet attached, obviously, in control of the bike all the time, and I don't have to worry about them skitting or bouncing about. Having said that, if you do want to run flats, a nice solid platform. Big pedals for me. You can get a small version of this pedal as well, this Crank Brothers here, but I run the big one. I'm big footed. I'm big pedaled, right? So I want a nice big contact patch. That way, if my foot does jiggle about a little bit, a smaller pedal, I might slip off of it easy. I haven't, I've got a nice solid platform there. Now it might depend on what shoe size you are, have a little think, but combining it with the right shoes as well, obviously makes a huge difference to the amount of grip you're gonna get. Onto wheels and tires now. This is 
one of the most important sort of setup aspects of an enduro bike, I think. So let's start with tires. Look, two six up the front, 2.4 at the back. Anything within that width range, I think, is going to be bang on. I myself run a 2.6 up the front and a 2.4 at the back, like I said. And while I'm doing it, I'm running enduro casings. So these are, these are virtually some of the thickest, most toughest casings you can get out there because you are pushing this bike to its limits. You're riding downhill tracks, essentially. So they need to be solid rubber underneath you. You need to have a good trusting tire, something that you know the sidewall's not gonna split or tear or tear a knob off the, the top of the actual tire itself, etc. So these are the enduro casing ones. And with that, generally comes softer compound. Now you might be thinking, Rich, flipping it, you gotta ride this round all day and it's gonna weigh a ton. All right, yes, they're not as light as trail tires, but myself and I know pretty much every other racer out there will sacrifice weight over reliability here because they don't want a puncture. A puncture when it comes to enduro is the most annoying thing ever, especially when you've got tubeless and inserts and stuff to deal with trail side. It's a hassle you wanna avoid, right? Soft compounds, nice and grippy, nice and comfortable, slightly narrower on the back, I run an arrow on the back because I like the back to have, bizarrely, a little less grip so I can flick it around. I'm, I'm quite, I like to steer with the rear, should we say, so that's why I go for a 2.4. And in my head as well, it's slightly less rolling resistance. Those are married up to wheels. But what wheels? Now, back in the day, carbon was a bit of a blasphemy term when it came to enduro racing. People were thinking, carbon wheels, they just break not worth the hassle. Aluminium, old reliable, faithful. If it busts, you bend it back. That kind of stigma has changed. However, carbon wheels are stiffer. So if you've got a really stiff bike, a really stiff frame, and you're running lots of other carbon parts, carbon wheels on top of that could be quite fatiguing. You might feel a lot of small bump and vibration for it. But the whole sort of breaking a lot myth has been debunked. Teams like Pivot, who are on Reynolds, should we say, well, they've done experiments where they've ran the same wheels the entire season and not had a problem at all. So with carbon wheels being more reliable now, some of that weight that you might have gained on the heavier tires, well, you can claim back on a lighter wheel. But like I said, feel does come into play. So you can see on my bike here, I've got the FSA gradients, front and rear, solid carbon wheels. I like the feel of them. They work well with the tires I've got and in conjunction with the frame, I'm not running carbon bars or anything like that. So actually that sort of vibration coming up through the bike isn't affecting me too much at all. Two pop, four pop, six pop, 160, 180, 203, 220. Braking is a bit of a minefield. Here's what I would recommend when it comes to enduro. A four pop brake is gonna be a must because it gives you a lot of power, should we say. There's you know four pistons on each brake, pressing against a disc. That's the way to go. Because remember, you're gonna generate a lot of heat, so you're gonna need a lot and a lot of speed, sorry. So you're gonna need a lot of braking force. When it comes to rotor size, well, in downhill, I harp back to that a little bit, that 220 is creeping in quite consistently now. I think personally, that's a little bit much. And we still don't really see that too much in enduro because whilst we do have some very flat out tracks, if you're away racing or even local racing, the speeds are generally still a lot slower. And the, sort of the need to brake sort of as harshly as quickly is a little bit less as well. 200 up front, 180 out the back or 200 out the back is I think the sweet spot. I think that is the creme de la creme of what you need for braking. So what I run is what a lot of people run. Floating rotors are the one. This essentially means it's what, not one big piece of metal. There is rivets in it, so it's detached. That means it can contract and expand. It can dissipate heat. I mean, you can even get vented rotors now as well, which help pull air around and keep them cool as well. There's fins on your brake pads to help keep the brake pads cool. And that's really, I think, the optimal setup for any kind of enduro race bike. Enduro riding is all about self-sufficiency, I like to think. So remember, if you're out on your own, out doing a big loop, racing or something, you're gonna be on your own. Or maybe have the odd rider around you, of course. But it means if you get into a pickle, you've gotta sort it out. So carrying the right equipment, carrying the right tools, spares, bits and bobs needed to fix your bike is absolutely critical. But there are some clever way enduro riders and manufacturers of enduro bikes have come to do this. Firstly, frame storage. Now, it's a revelation when it comes to mountain bikes. I like to think it's actually pretty genius. Take my Rallon, for example, and a lot of other bikes out there. In here, you lift off this flap, essentially where the water bowl is, and you can just store stuff. That whole down tube is hollow. You know, people like Orbea are again, inbuilt frame tools. So in here, I've got a little magnetic multi-tool just inside the linkage. There's a six mil as my quick release at the back. I mean, 
it's really, really clever. And then on top of that, other companies you can add onto your bike. So look, I don't want to harp on it. PE's, the dust caps on the valves are valve core removal tools or a spoke key. That's mind boggling. And then strapping stuff to your bike as well, finding nice, neat solutions. So this Topeak strap here, I've got CO2 canister, the inflator. I've got these Tope Topeak tire levers, which also are chain splitters. And having all these really clever storage solutions just worked well, even like having a, a, a spare power link and some duct tape actually on my handlebars, just in case I needed it. Okay, gearing. So what gearing should you run and what gearing do the pros use? Well, in the EDR, they're absolute weapons. So whilst a lot of us are using 50 to 50 tooth sort of biggest sprocket on the back cassettes, those guys and girls are running up to about 45. And on the front, we're running 32, 34, maybe some of us 30. They're also running that, they're running that 32, 34. But remember, they got the legs for it. That's what they do, they're pros. If you're new to it, I'd recommend one of those big wide ratio cassettes at the rear. It means you've got all the gear in, it means you can get up most climbs, but you can also sprint back down as well. A one by system is obviously the way to go now. One by 12, ideally, one by 11 works absolutely fine. Hey, if you wanna run one by 10, no problem. Remember, the other reason EDR guys and girls do it as well, if they're running that 45, the cassettes are actually considerably lighter. So they are looking to save weight in certain places. Whilst I said about tires, you might wanna sacrifice weight in certain areas. You don't wanna be hauling around an absolute tank of a bike all the time. So if you've got the legs for it and you can save some weight, running a smaller cassette is one of those areas that you can shave a few grams off of. And actually, I just really thought about something on the tire thing. Inserts, great idea. Stick an insert in the back. Remember, they're taking a lot of impacts. So an insert on the rear is a bonus as well. But anyway, that is my ultimate enduro setup guide. Let me know what you think. Is there anything you do differently to your enduro bike? It's pretty much how I have mine. If you want to know any more questions about how I have mine set up for racing anything from EDRs to local enduros, let me know in the comments down below. I'm always well keen on the enduro stuff. So drop us a question. I'll get down there and answer it for you. But for now, from sunny old Phoenix, I'm out of here because I need a good old glass of water. Not a cup of tea like you thought I was going to say. See ya.